Hi folks, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. I want to talk about a few things. I'm going to church. It's uh, Friday evening and uh, my church is, is not on because they've um, people are on holiday. So So that's where that's so I've been invited to a conference. It's a Black Pentecostal uh, church and uh, they have it every year so I'm going to go to that now. I've been waiting all day for my car to be fixed, it's been fixed so I'm just going to uh, test it out. But uh, the, I've been doing a lot of studying because we're going to Hyde Park this Sunday. Um, so um, I've been getting ready for that. And uh, just to say we've got missionaries coming in, coming next week. So pray that that goes really well. Uh, there's a wonderful brother I've been talking to on the phone. And uh, he and his family are coming and they're going to stay with us and we're going to do some evangelism in Manchester. So that's exciting, so pray about that. I'm really looking forward to it because I know that this brother is a, a godly man and uh, I just feel one in spirit with him. So, so just pray that the Lord will bless that. Uh, I want to talk about a few things. Some of it will be technical, so f some of it's for pastors, some of it's for apologists, and some uh, for anybody who just wants to learn about Christianity. So that's what we're going to talk about while I'm driving to church, which will be about 25 minutes. So, um, just a shout out. Uh, this is a book called The Confession of Faith by A. H. Hodge, published by The Banner of Truth. And um, it's a really, really good book. I'm just reading it at the moment. Uh, it's the Confession of Faith, A. H. Hodge, Banner Truth. Uh, whatever uh, age you are, whatever level of Christianity you are, get hold of that book and have a read, pray over it, meditate over it, it'll really bless you. And then for any pastors out there, uh, Paul, An Outline of His Theology by Herman uh, Ridderboss, published by uh, SPCK. It's one of the best books on Paul's theology. So, uh, Paul, an outline of his theology by Herman Ridderboss. All right. So, what I want to talk about while we're driving, I want to talk about the canon. I want to talk about the church. I want to talk about scripture. I want to talk about the gospel, etc. I just want to make sure that this is on. Sorry about that. So, those are the topics that I want to tackle. So first of all, while I'm driving, I just want to share, I've nearly finished this book, there's a couple of pages and then I've finished. So this book is The Heresy of Orthodoxy uh, by Michael J. Kruger and Andreas J. Kostenberger, published by Opolis. I want to talk about that while we drive and then I want to talk about a few other topics as well. So, so I'll just make sure that this is, sorry about this. Okay, we're going to go, folks. Thanks for your prayers. I feel the best. I, I, haven't, I haven't feel as good as this for years. So your prayers are being answered because I just feel really blessed, really encouraged. So thank you for all your prayers. Uh, that's wonderful. So thank you. I can feel your prayers. I can feel strength in me and... Uh, I just feel great and it's down to your prayer so thank you so much so God is good so we're getting out of here now so uh, basically here's an argument that's from America by Bart Ehrman Bart Ehrman is one of the top scholars in America who criticizes the Bible the thing is Bart Ehrman is used a lot by Muslim apologists um, and basically the argument goes like this that the New Testament was chosen by the church at the Council of Nicaea and how do we know that they chose the right books? It was a political decision and we don't even know which are the right books to be in the New Testament. That's basically the argument. And then the sub-arguments such as they couldn't have written the New Testament because they were, um, they were educated people, right? So that, that's basically the argument. Now, this has had a powerful impact in America and it's beginning to be promoted in the UK there are Muslim scholars, Muslim apologists now that are trying to get the British public to read Bart Ehrman and stuff. So, 
So the book that I've just showed you, this book, is basically debunking that. Now, Bart Ehrman is a, a, an eminent scholar, but the works that he's written, I'll just get out of here. The works that he's written are popular works to try to attack evangelical Christianity and the Bible Belt in America. But he is a top scholar and so basically his ideas, he's got his ideas from a scholar called Dr. Bauer. Dr. Bauer in the 1930s came up with these ideas and Bart Ehrman's popularised them. Bart Ehrman has uh, popularised these ideas and basically let's get over this hill so Dr. Bauer is to blame now Dr. Bauer's influenced academic work against the Bible because his idea is that there's no one um, one orthodoxy there's many different views so when we go to history there are many different views of what Christianity was there's no one right Christianity so it's no good trying to look for a canon in history right and he uses four areas where he does his study to, to prove this Edessa uh, uh, parts of Asia Asia wasn't Asia as we know it but it was like Turkey in that day and a couple of other places now How do we answer this? How do we answer Bart Ehrman? How do we answer Dr. Bauer? We need to know, first of all, heresy was reacting against orthodoxy. Heresy was reacting against orthodoxy. They were already orthodox there. And you can find that internally within the New Testament. You can find it like Paul in Galatians chapter 1, Cursed is anyone who preaches not the gospel. 1 John where it talks about if anyone does not believe the Son, let him be cursed. And also in the book of Revelation it talks about different heretics and ideas. So it shows you there there was an orthodoxy and the heterodox, those who didn't believe in orthodoxy, were reacting to orthodoxy. So there was one clear Christianity right at the beginning. And you can find that internally within the New Testament. Uh, secondly, the four areas that uh, Dr. Bauer chose, recent research has been shown that actually Orthodox people were flourishing in those areas and uh, heterodoxy, uh, those that were Orthodox, they weren't as numerous as he made out to be. Now let's get to Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman and others would say that the gospel, that, that you know, the Council of Nicaea and, and it was like a political t decision to make to to confirm the New Testament. So in Kruger's book, he comes up with a brilliant argument about covenant. In the Old Testament, there was the idea of a covenant, and the covenant was given with Scripture. So the covenant was ratified with Scripture. So Moses was given the Ten Commandments, but it was ratified as Scripture written on tablets of stone, you see. So already there you've got a, a, a covenant with scripture and you have right early on in Judaism this idea of when there's a covenant, there's scripture. And so in the old covenant they knew that it, there was a gap, that it had not completely ended, that there was a, a conclusion missing for this covenant. So when it came to the time of Jesus, they knew, the Jews knew that whoever was the Messiah, it would come with a new covenant and then it would, by implication, come with a new scripture. Now that's a powerful argument if you can grasp that and the significance of that. It will help you to debunk anything that Bart Ehrman or any scholar throws against you about the issues of the canon. So what it shows you there, rather than looking at history and looking back from the Council of Nicaea, which didn't actually choose scripture by the way, that's a myth, but instead of looking back from history, you're looking at the beginning from the time of the New Testament and the theology of the New Testament and the Old Testament about the idea of covenant. Secondly, the Lord Jesus Christ gave certain leaders authority, he gave apostles authority. 
So again, that shows you there was a clear orthodoxy right at the beginning. Um, and then we'll take some minor issues. On the issue of um, the uh, people were not educated, well, Matthew was a tax collector, he was educated. Paul, uh, John, Paul was definitely educated. And Paul, uh, sorry, and John, well, he um, he was known by uh, the workers of that uh, uh, in, in the temple, the high priest. So he obviously had some kind of connection with the temple, which means he wasn't as non-educated as as they they would assume. The other thing as well is that fishermen in Galilee were like middle class, not working class. We have information to know that fish were ate from Galilee, even in Rome. All right. The other thing as well is scripture was told to be read out. Paul said, read my letters out. So what we're seeing here, people did have education. They could write. Um, but what we're seeing is there was a concept of scripture from covenant, a concept of scripture in the importance of reading it. Right early on, there was an idea of what scripture was. All right. It wasn't like some afterthought of 300 years later. We can see that in the time of Jesus. So that's by Ehrman sorted. And... Uh, this is technical stuff for an apologist, but if you're a Christian, if you just play back what I've said, think about it, listen to the criticisms that people make against the New Testament, and it'll help you. Just a few side remarks. People will say, well, what about the old church fathers? They like the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. It has the uh, Barnabas in there, the Epistle of Barnabas. So didn't they think that was scripture? No. Sometimes they had these other extra books in. The new, with the New Testament, but they were seen as liturgical, just books for edification. It doesn't necessarily mean there was scripture. And that, and it's verified because often these books like uh, Barnabas were put with an appendix or at the end or in a way that showed that they, you know, they were not exactly the same as scripture. Just a little nuanced thing that some scholars miss. So that's the issue of the canon. I want to talk about um, the gospel, the preaching of the gospel and the, and the state of the church. Spurgeon was in the downgrade controversy and Spurgeon uh, said that, you know, the church is going to apostatize, it's becoming more and more modern. And, and that's what we've seen over the years. The church is becoming more and more secular. I keep saying this. But the church is becoming more and more secular. And the reason why the church is not having an effect in the West is because probably a lot of the people in the church aren't converted. And it's because we're not preaching the Word of God and we're not preaching the Gospel. We're not preaching heaven and hell and repentance and the need to believe in Jesus Christ and repent of our sin. People are... are, are it's, we're seeing what is called antinomianism. The idea that we don't have to obey the law, we can just live the way we want and you know, we don't have to show any fruit for our repentance. And so the church is in a demise and in a terrible state in the West. And the Bible says, preach the word in season out of season. It says, by the foolishness of preaching. And what we're seeing in the church today is really a church that's full of tears. It's full of people who are probably not converted and people who want carnal things. They want to be entertained. They want to be entertained. They want carnal entertainment. They want rappers or they want films or they want anything, but they don't want to preach the wrath of God or hell or repentance. And so you need to be aware of this, that the church is in a mess. The church needs to come back to the simple preaching of the gospel and the simple preaching of the word of God in the churches, rather than this entertainment and this dumbing down the gospel. So that's about the gospel in the church. And then I want to talk about evolution. Evolution is a myth. Evolution is a myth. And it's as simple as that. The way to defeat as an evolutionist is to talk about the process of evolution. Natural selection and mutations is supposed to be the process that proves that evolution takes place. Now there is such thing as macroevolution and microevolution. Microevolution is changes small changes like a rabbit becoming a bigger rabbit, smaller rabbit, black rabbit, yellow rabbit. That's microevolution. Macroevolution is big changes from a rabbit to a dinosaur type of thing. I don't want to make exaggerate, but you get my drift. 
Now this macroevolution, nobody's ever seen it in time. Nobody's ever observed it. And here's the point. Darwin, when he was analyzing his finches, asked an evolutionist about Darwin's finches. And said, what are the finches? They've got finches. And they go, oh, they were big finches, little finches. They had big beaks, little beaks, and all these things, they'll say. Okay. But, are they finches? Yeah, yeah, but they changed. Big little finches, little finches, big, you know. Yeah, but are they still finches? Yeah. Yeah, they're still finches. We've never seen a finch change into a dinosaur or a finch change into a crocodile. Finches are still finches. And that's the point with evolution. Nobody has ever observed macro evolution, these big changes. So what people are doing is going back into history, back into the, the history of DNA or the history of, you know, like they'll say, oh, we're 99% near, near chimpanzee. Well, we're 70% we're the same kind of DNA as a sea slug. Does that make, mean sea slugs are, are our ancestors? You know what I mean? What they're doing is they're looking back at history. Bones and whatever they want to look at, history of DNA, whatever they look at. And they look back. They look back, right? And it's their interpretation. It's their interpretation of the data, of the history. Sorry about this. Just went round the wrong way. <laughs> Sorry. So it's their interpretation of the data, of the history. They've never observed it. They've, nobody's ever observed it, my friend. That's the point. So it's somebody's interpretation of the history. Dr. Mayer, one of the great apologists, uh, great of evolutionist, and uh, a great evolutionist, I, I don't agree with him, but he was an expert in evolution, and he basically, he basically uh, said that evolution's a historical science. So what that means is nobody's ever observed the actual process of evolution, macroevolution. So people look at it, they're looking at history. So all this tree of life and all this stuff is all nonsense. That's just make-believe where people have had a theory and then they've gone back to to the history and then they've said this is this and this is this. But they, they don't know. They can never really say, uh, bring it all together and say we, we, the, we've got a family tree from this and that and whatever. You know, they've changed it from tree of life. Now they, they call it the web of life. It's a web. So they change it all the time. And uh, one of the proofs that evolution's not true is in the 1960s, there were mathematicians who met with the evolutionists. And these were people who, who were not Christian. And they met with the evolutionists. And they said, look, mathematically, we've worked this out. It just doesn't add up. But the evolutionists kept those papers quiet. They didn't publish, they, they didn't, well, they didn't want these papers to be known. They tried to squash the information. That mathematically, if you work it out with evolution, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. So, yeah, so that's evolution. So we've, we've looked at canon, we've looked at uh, the gospel, and we've looked at evolution. So that's it really. Uh, I just want to thank you for um, for your support, for your prayers and for your encouragement. I'm going to read a scripture, a couple of scriptures. And 2 Timothy chapter 4. I charge thee therefore breath, uh, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at the appearing of his kingdom, Preach the word, be in season, out of season, remove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, that they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned from fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto the Lamatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychius I have sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, which thou comest bring with thee in the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith, coppersmith did me much evil, and the Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou were also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that I may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I w was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto a heavenly kingdom, to whom? To whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. And I, I just want to say to you, stand in your post today. You know, there is a hell. There is a wrath. There is a judgment to come. Make no, no doubt about it. There is a wrath and there is a judgment to come. And the only hope that we have, the only way that we have is salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for us. He shed his blood. And that is what we need to be proclaiming. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be lifting him up and proclaiming him in these evil days. So what, wherever you are today, whether you're a mum, a dad, a, a child at school, a child at college, wherever you are today, stand at your post. Stand at your post and live in the glory and presence of Christ and proclaim Christ and be bold and don't back down and don't be frightened and don't be scared. Say, so here I am, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, and I'm proclaiming my Lord. So stand your post. And I want to say to those who are preachers today, that wherever you are preaching today, whether it be in Africa, whether it be in China, whether it be in Germany, where, wherever you are today where you are preaching the gospel or sharing the gospel, you are doing the greatest work that man can do. You are saving souls. And God is with you, and God will stand with you, and God will provide for you, and God will bless you, my friend. Whatever has come against you, however, whatever mistakes, whatever battles, whatever you faced, whatever challenges you faced, whatever you're facing now, whether you've had a rebellion in your church as a pastor and people left, whether you feel your ministry is not being blessed as it should as a pastor or a preacher, whether as an evangelist you don't see the fruit as much as you'd like, I just want to say right now God's with you and right now God uh, is standing with you and just proclaim that word and, and honor God and proclaim it and God will bless you. You're doing the greatest work that a man or a woman could ever do. And I just want to share one last scripture with you. And I want to thank you for the prayers that you've been giving me because I feel so strengthened at the moment so encouraged and so strengthened so thank you so much for your prayers and i feel like a new man i don't know what's happened but people must have prayed for me the last day or two so thank you so much here's a wonderful scriptures to to encourage us for we know that if our earthly house of the tabernacle were dissolved this is 2 corinthians chapter 5 we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we sh shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that which will be unclothed, but clothed upon the mortality, might be swallowed up in life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also have given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and, and, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one 
may receive the things done in his body according to that which he has done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest into your conscience. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is to your cause. And here it is. For the love of Christ constrains us, us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ. Why are we going out there? Why are we sharing the gospel? Why are we proclaiming the word? Because we know the terror of the Lord. We know there's a fearful wrath and judgment day coming. And we know the only hope that people have is coming to know the Lord as their Lord and Savior. So stand at your post, wherever God's put you, and continue to share that wonderful message of his love. God bless you.